Okay, so uh, this is remodeling Rails projects. In particular, I want to talk about how it works as a consultant because I'm a consultant. And a lot of times there is a lot of remodeling that is obviously calling out uh, to have happened. So I was just wondering, how many people here are consultants or freelancers or something like that? Okay, good, like a pretty decent proportion, cool. Uh, well, hopefully this will be especially relevant to you, although it should be relevant to everybody. So <clears throat> there's a few topics I want to cover tonight. Um, the consulting, the, the particular role that a consultant has and, and how, how the engagements uh, unfold and change. And in particular, uh, the sort of issues that come up around design and process improvements as, as opportunities to dig in deeper into the work. Uh, so a little bit of background about me first. I've been a web developer for a long time, uh, so hopefully I should have some idea of what I'm talking about. And I, I did the startup world. I was the first engineer to start up and sort of built everything out as a Rails application. And, and then I went and traveled around with ThoughtWorks, which is a big consulting firm. And ThoughtWorks are really into software craftsmanship, but they also deal with these huge enterprise clients. And the clients aren't necessarily at the same level. Uh, so there's also a lot of tension, and you, you see the whole spectrum in terms of how sophisticated people are. And uh, since I left ThoughtWorks, what I've been trying to do is combine those process insights and so forth from ThoughtWorks with essentially just getting into the uh, nitty gritty of Rails. Uh, so the first thing that you do as a consultant is you have to set up an engagement. And usually the, the client has called you because they want you to do some important thing. Usually it's like houses on fire type of scenario. It's not where it's like, oh, what if we were 2% you know, uh, better at testing this year? Wouldn't that be great? No, it's more like, oh, everything's broken, or we just missed a big deadline. That's a really copy, uh, common one. Um, so th what you'll find when somebody hires you to do something like that is that usually uh, the acute problem as soon as you start working on it, trying to fix that, that big problem or whatever it is, you discover that it's just the tip of this giant iceberg and that there are an enormous amount of process problems and architectural problems underlying that, which uh, as you get to know the team and they get to trust you and see that you know what you're doing, you can start to address them a little better. So let's look at some structural issues uh, that might be leading people off the rails here. The first one is architecture. And uh, in particular, I'm, I'm not going to dive too much into uh, the, the sort of really general architecture and refactoring kind of issues. I'm going to try and talk a little bit more specifically about things that happen in Rails. I'm going to talk about development processes, which you guys, I'm sure, are probably familiar with many of the things like whether it's TDD or continuous integration and so forth, uh, operations, DevOps, and planning, which would be more like agile. So the architectural one first. Uh, Rails was really powerful. When Rails came on the scene, it was a huge improvement over writing little crappy PHP scripts where you inlined your logic. And I don't know if anybody else did that. Maybe that was just me. Um, so Rails was great. And Rails came out, I don't know, like mid-2000s or something like that. So it's actually getting pretty old now. I think it's at least a decade old. And uh, it provides a whole set of really powerful defaults, uh, the, the biggest one probably being the model view controller architecture that everybody's familiar with. Uh, however, there is an issue with, with using that architecture, which is that Rails is like, here are your three buckets, models, controllers, views. Put your code here. That's like the message that people get, I think especially new developers, is that your code goes in these buckets. And as it turns out, once your application starts to grow, that doesn't work that well. And that dumping uh, 100 methods into a model uh, is, is very common. Maybe not 100, but models have a tendency. People know, I think, not to make giant controllers. That like, lesson has been hammered into people. But they don't know not to make giant models. And as a result, models become this dumping ground for all the business logic of applications. <clears throat> so uh, there are a few object-oriented design principles that I think could guide us as we try and break, uh, I, well, I don't want to say break, the, the MVC architecture is great, and it stays there. But move beyond that. Extend the rails a little bit further so that they cover more cases. So the first one of these is the single responsibility principle. This is probably the most important thing. I think most people have heard about this. But when you're uh, thinking about MVC, the single responsibility of a model is loading data and persisting data and validating it and doing data-related things. And it's not like carrying out all of the business-related operations of your application, which is what it usually becomes. So uh, the 
there are a few different common refactorings that are really valuable once you start working in, in these applications you, you, and, and you realize how hard it is to, to deal with these giant scopes where p you could have all kinds of interactions happening that, that wouldn't be uh, easy to track because nothing's encapsulated within a given model. So uh, by breaking down your objects into your models into lots of plain Ruby objects, it's pretty easy to get, um, I shouldn't say it's pretty easy. It's actually can be quite challenging depending on where you're starting. But you're able to create objects which are much, much easier to test and, and to work with. Uh, there, you might see that the second piece here is composition over inheritance. The standard way that I see people breaking down giant models in Rails applications, and here I'm talking about, th these are Rails applications where people have called me because they have a problem, right? So I'm sure that your Rails applications don't do this. <laughs> but the, there's, a, there's a common pattern that I've seen where you get a bunch of modules. So the, the giant superclass has been separated into several topic areas, each of which goes into a different module, and each of which is included into your model. But the problem with this is all, all you've done is not, without creating encapsulation, you've moved things into different files so that it's hard to even see. Oh, here's a method. I want to change what this method does. Who's calling this method? I'm looking through my file. OK, it's a private method. Nobody's calling it, right? Or, oh, maybe, but maybe you're including a, a module that's using it or something like that. Or it just makes it a lot harder to track what's going on. And uh, since Rails has introduced concerns, this, uh, does everybody know what concerns are? So concerns are just basically a simpler way. They just provide a little bit of, of syntactic sugar overwriting modules, basically, that you can include into your models and controllers. Um, but since they put that bucket there, now we've got models, views, controllers, and oh, concerns. There are another place you can put stuff. And I think that actually introducing concerns without people understanding what concerns are for, which is basically like really common scopes that you might have repeated that you'd want to be reusing from model to model or something like that, they've just become the place to put stuff. If it's not going into your model, just put it in a concern. So uh, the, co the, the, the second principle is composition over inheritance, which is don't include, don't put, suck in all of this behavior that you don't necessarily need. Uh, instead, use mod, uh, have your model consume other classes that have uh, a single responsibility following the single responsibility principle. So this is like, as a specific Rails type of problem, uh, probably the most, these, these are probably the, the most common organizational issues I see. The third one here is the, being the principle of least surprise which is uh, Rails, again, provides a common feature with a lot of people like to use, which is callbacks in models. And these are, in my opinion, super harmful because essentially what you're doing is overriding the behavior of create or update or save or whatever it is. Um, the, you wouldn't normally do that. It's, okay, it's not quite as bad as overriding malloc or something like that. But at the same time, uh, you expect these to be low-level operations. And you might do something that seems really innocuous, like having a uh, welcome mail be sent to a user on, you know, after create. Or you have an order, and when the order is uh, saved or, or created, let's say, it automatically creates a subscription for the user. And when the subscription is created, it automatically creates a transaction which bills the user's credit card. Okay. Now when you go to import your legacy orders, you get this chain hopping along from model to model not at all visible that this is going to be happening when somebody's writing their import script to import their legacy orders. They're just like, OK, my, the expected result of this is one new row in the database. But instead, I got three objects, an email sent here, and credit cards billing here. And you have essentially a consumer uh, relations nightmare. So these are just the kind of things that can happen with something that seems really innocuous that people use because the bucket is there, because the feature is there. It's listed in, when you learn about Rails, oh, documenting Rails features, right? They tell you about all of these uh, features, and you assume that that's the way that things should be done. At least this is what happened to me when I was learning Rails. And just breaking out these uh, classic object-oriented design principles and applying them to create plain Ruby objects, which are easy to test, which can encapsulate this behavior uh, is really a much easier way to go. And in the case of the principle of least surprise, the easiest way to do it is just create an object, let's say, that builds your user, your new user, sends the email, um, or you know, processes your order, builds the related records. That just goes into a single object. You can exactly see what it's supposed to use, and you just call that object from your controller. <clears throat> so that's uh, 
that's just a little bit about architecture. And since that was kind of a long talk, does anybody have any questions? I just gave a big spiel there. Um, obviously, you can ask questions whenever you want. Um, I have a tendency to shout them out. So, uh, no? OK. <clears throat> OK, uh, development process improvements. So another thing that comes up a lot is you start working on a, a project, and you realize that there are some process issues that seem like they're not, uh, they're not operating as, as efficiently as they could be. And obviously, one of those is testing. I think everybody, everybody in the Rails world knows that automated tests are the way to go. And uh, at the same time, not everybody practices test-driven development as a design strategy. Uh, but this is exactly the kind of process that if you put it into place, allows you to remind yourself, oh yeah, I need to create these easily testable objects. I'm going to create plain Ruby objects. I'm going to apply object-oriented design principles. So this is, a, this is a process that supports healthy development. I, I think of this as being, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like, the, these, this is sort of like curing the lifestyle diseases or something like that. It's like, oh, I'm having a heart attack. It's like, oh, well, do you exercise? No? OK, maybe start there. So uh, this, is, this is like the, the baseline stuff that really builds on itself to create like a virtuous circle and, and grow the, the health of the project. So right along with that is continuous refactoring. If you're confident in your application because you have all these tests for it, that means that you can safely refactor it. If you're not confident, there's a good chance that you're going to say, oh, I don't want to touch that. I don't know what's going to get broken if I go in there. So uh, continuous refactoring is really building on the process of doing test-driven development uh, it, it, as uh, it enables it. And um, the, the other uh, advantage of the continuous refactoring is that you don't have to do a giant refactoring. And in fact, if you just get in the habit of doing a bit of refactoring along with adding a given feature or something like that, you don't have to make a case for why you need to take two weeks off to refactor everything. In other words, it, it's, it's, a, it's a way that developers can use to just create a constant stream of improvements going into the code base without having to necessarily get any approval for it. So uh, as a consultant, things that you can do without needing to get approval are very good. Okay, <clears throat> Continuous integration. Uh, a lot of times people talk about CI, and what they mean is, I have this server that runs my tests. And that's great. It's great to do that and to make sure that you, everybody can see what the status of the build is and so forth. But continuous integration actually doesn't mean that, or it didn't originally. It was more something like trunk-based development. Like people are not creating long-running feature branches that then you have to deal with merging back into master to do things like build this giant new feature or refactor everything. But in enterprise, you see this sort of thing happening all the time. Um, hopefully for startups, it's small enough and people communicate enough that it's not a big deal. But the GitHub uh, workflow where people create pull requests and they sit around for a while and eventually get code reviewed and maybe merged in next week or whatever, this is not continuous integration. Continuous integration is like every day you merge back into master and that way nothing diverges and you don't have to deal with these big, um, essentially these big painful merge scenarios. So I, by the way, just as an anecdote, I've seen situations where it took people two months to get branches merged because they've been developing them separately for four months. <laughs> like, I'm going to have a refactor everything. But yeah, anyways, that's a, hopefully you don't have that problem. But uh, this is the kind of practice, though. You can't just do, do trunk-based development without making sure that uh, you're writing tests so that you know that your changes aren't going to break everything and therefore you feel comfortable merging into master all the time. And in, in the Agile world, there's a saying that if something hurts, do it more often. So this is exactly that kind of thing, just constantly, continuously merging, continuously integrating back into your trunk. So then there's operational improvements. And this is the same thing I was just talking about. Uh, if it hurts, do it more often. A lot of places have a fear of deployment because when you deploy, there's a good chance that something might break if, you're, if you don't have it fully automated. So having a one-click deployment is like a huge win for, for uh, the team's ability to be constantly delivering value. And this constant, uh, deliver, constantly delivering value is a, one of the themes of agile development practices. And it's not only, is it, uh, not only is it good for the business, but I think it's good for the development team too because there's a sense of being really connected to something. And it's sort of like, um, you know, if every time you push, it goes out to users within an hour after running a bunch of tests, 
uh, that's pretty amazing. I mean, that's, that's like an ideal, uh, what we call continuous delivery scenario, which is sort of like if you're really hardcore about continuous integration and you have great tests, then you can, you can do that. Uh, and and so there are some companies out there that are having a lot of success. But um, operational issues. So if, if you have an ops silo and a dev silo, I think uh, it's very, as is typical, anytime you get into a larger organization, um, you're going to have a lot of problems doing these releases. And you're going to have to persuade uh, operations that you want to do things in a different way and so forth. So bringing people together and creating a DevOps practice where you can do one-click deploys because all of your deployments is automated. It's all written in software and checked into version control is a great win. And then, of course, monitoring everything like our friends here at New Relic help us do. Uh, that's, uh, it's surprising how many people aren't recording the exceptions that come out of their applications. Um, <clears throat> so appropriate measures. There's obviously a, a lot of process that you can apply. There is a great deal of depth that you can get into if you want to have really formal processes you, with, with sprint planning meetings and retrospectives, and that sort of thing. If you want to be doing continuous delivery, where you're, every time you push code to get it, it gets immediately merged to master and then deployed live to tens of thousands of users, uh, that's probably not going to happen when you're just getting started with a small project. And uh, likewise, you can get a lot of the value that you get out of a situation like that by using a, a platform as a service offering like Heroku. So it doesn't have to be a huge investment to get um, some pretty uh, quick, regular deployments happening. Uh, enterprise is notorious for using way too much process, but startups actually often use too little, meaning they don't have any formal process. When I was, um, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide here because that seems like it's perfect. When I was doing my initial uh, startup work at Bespoke Post, I was thinking about processes to put into place. And you know, I'd certainly heard a lot of things about Agile. And I thought, well, that just means we're not a big enterprise who sucks and takes forever to do everything, right? That's, we're startups, so we're fast. And we don't need a process. But it turns out that that sort of cowboy mentality is not what people who know about Agile process actually mean. There are specific rituals that people put into place where you do things like you make sure to get together with your stakeholder. You designate a stakeholder to be the person who speaks on behalf of the product team, a product uh, not, not, not the people developing the product, but uh, the consumers of the product. And uh, having regular meetings with them, making sure that they are uh, prioritizing the work to be done. It's amazing how many projects I've been on where the developers are just like, hey, I think X should happen. I'm going to make a story for that and just start working on it. It's actually the norm in my experience. And I do this too, especially if you think you can get it done really fast. That might be fine. But when you have a larger team, you can't just have everybody doing this because suddenly your planned sprint that was delivering important features that have business consequences and potentially millions of dollars just got pushed out another week because people invented 20 tasks that maybe weren't super critical to the business. So uh, having, actual, having actually formalized process get, becomes really important once you get to that size. And, uh, and writing, likewise, writing the stories so that when people pick them up out of their story tracker, they say, OK, I, I see this, I know how to do this, or I have an idea of how to do it. And uh, it's clearly valuable. And it says in the story who it's valuable to. And I can think about that and make sense of it. And what that means is that you probably need to have somebody actually analyzing the stories. Because the requests that come in for managers are not stories. They're just requests that come in for managers. And you need somebody who's technical, but who also understands the business requirements to sit down with them usually, this is often called like a business analyst, and to write an actual story that makes sense to a developer uh, and that provides the value that the business needs. And these are all just sort of different ways ultimately of managing your backlog so that when you sit down to work, you can just grab your coffee and get in the zone, uh, you know, looking at the story and, and going and, and checking it off. And, and it's really hard if you look at it and you're like, what does that mean? And like, who? And like, do I need to call this person? And it just is a big drag on team productivity. So as a consultant coming in and advocating for these kind of things in an organization, there, uh, there are certain advantages that you have compared to people who are already in the organization. So one is you're an outsider, which means that uh, you, know, you haven't gotten used to the way things are, which is what happens when you're in a place for a while. And you're not an employee, so you can easily go and poke people 
even if you know, that might not be good for your long-term career. And you can say, hey, this needs to change. And like, what, what's going on over here? And you can sort of like get into people's business in a way that would not be appropriate necessarily if you're an employee and that people wouldn't appreciate. But because you're, you've been brought in as a consultant to help people with something, you have a mandate to be a bit of a gadfly and uh, you know, to get on people's nerves and, not, and interrupt them when they're trying to do the thing so that you can look at the big picture. And uh, that's why the, the special privilege of the role of a consultant, I think, is to, you, you know, they, somebody brings you in to do a specific task, but you have the opportunity and the perspective, because you've worked on a lot of projects and because you're not in too deep, to reflect, how are things actually going right now? And what really matters? And you can have those conversations with people because you don't necessarily have uh, a full stack of work that you have to do all the time. You can sort of th think about the project strategically and of what's going to give people the most value. And no, e there's, e there's even a psychological dimension here. Like a lot of people aren't comfortable with talking about team dynamic issues because they're on the team. But you know, sometimes you notice, oh, this interaction is toxic. Maybe we should talk to someone about that or whatever it would be. Uh, and, if, and if you're an employee, then that's a really uncomfortable thing to do sometimes. Uh, ultimately, this is all about communication. Uh, the biggest problems that software projects have are building the wrong thing, not understanding the customers, not understanding the business users, uh, and you know, not knowing what to do because the work hasn't been prioritized. These are all communication tasks. So thinking about the communication is, is definitely the, uh, a high priority. Another thing to think about is that change is slow. And people change slowly, and people have habits. And the only way to, to really change organization of any size is to build strong relationships with people. It's not going to be about just diving in there and changing the code. Uh, although, when you're pairing with people and working with them day after day, that can have a big influence on a team. But uh, being able to, to just be there and to be the one to sort of like hold a sense of like, this could be better, and I'm, I'm going to be the one to stick my neck out because you know, it doesn't hurt that much if somebody, somebody whacks it. Uh, that's also very valuable. And, and I think you know, people appreciate someone taking on that role. And that's the end. So uh, thank you. And if anybody needs help with these sorts of things, you can, you can talk to me. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, no, I haven't. But I don't think it's that similar, actually. There's this, there's this kind of, uh... <laughs> no, but uh, the, the, the guy that built the uh, Eiffel Tower is pissed, though. Because I think it kind of looks like that, also. <laughs> well, no, he was just the architect. He, you know. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, thanks.